morning, we welcome you and we're glad that you're able to be a part of today's service, which is our first service since the end of July. So, um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you to our tech team and our worship team and all the, all the work you've done over the past year, going through all this stuff with, with the COVID and all that and getting us online and doing that. So let's give them a big hand. Yeah. And we gave them the month of August to just be able to take a break from all this. I mean, there was a little bit of tech going on, of course. And, and also want to say thank you to everyone who helped through August particularly because we changed the service up and had tables out, which I think some of us may kind of miss this morning. Um, and, uh, and for those who shared and Lovell uh, led us in worship a lot of the time and some others did as well, Gene did. And thank you to Doc once again last Sunday. So thank you for everyone who helps out around here. All right. So welcome to uh, our service this morning. Let's pray. Our loving God and Father, we just want to thank you for today. Today is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it because you're here, and we're here to worship you, and we're here to turn our hearts and our minds even our physical bodies towards you in our worship time. So, Lord, bless our time. And for those who have joined us online today, Father, I just pray your blessing over everyone. And uh... even though I walk through the valley. It's coming. 
Would you never let go of me? Oh, no, you never let go Through the calm and through the storm Oh, no, you never let go Every high and every low Oh, no, you never let go Lord, you never let go of me You never let go,
great is your faithfulness, your faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is Oh, 
I will see of the goodness of God. Let's just sing that out together one more time. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath. been faithful all my life you have been so so good every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now. you may be seated this morning. Well, folks, it's great to have our team back. <laughs> yeah, let's give them a hand. Yeah. You know, it's wonderful to be able to express worship in all the multifaceted ways that he allows us to do that. And sometimes it's quiet, sometimes it's got more volume to it and more instruments, and, and sometimes it's just being still and, and know that I'm God. Amen. Really, the, the whole process, the purpose of worship is to bow before him. Proskaneo, toward to kiss, is what the word is in, in I believe it's the Gospel of John. And, uh, you know, kiss is that intimate thing that we do, right? Where you get close to your child, or close to your wife or husband or spouse, and you have that moment of heart-to-heart -heart intimacy. And God invites us to come before him and, and worship and bow before him. And so we do that this morning. So, Father, we do that in our hearts today. Thank you so much for allowing us this privilege of worship in music, worship in the word, worship in our quietness, worship in every form that you lead us into, Lord. But it's all about our relationship with you and, and closeness with you. So, Lord... Even as I pray this morning, I pray you bring our hearts and our minds and our soul and our spirit and just bring us into that place of worship where we revere you, where we stand in awe of you, where we look upon your face and behold the beauty of the Lord. And we gaze, we gaze upon you. And in that gaze, there's so much happens. All our fears and concerns just get lesser and lesser. And we need that today. Lord, we need to just gaze upon you. We need to look upon you, find you, seek you. Lord, on behalf of every one of us here this morning in this room, and on behalf of those who are tuned in today online, we... We come before you and we seek you. We ask that we would be able to see just a bit more of you through your word, through the atmosphere of worship, and in the inner hearts, there'd be the light that would shine brightly in the midst of a dark world. And we thank you that you are always faithful. <laughs> Just as those words said, with our lives laid down, we surrender now. And we do that even this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. What a great song. What a great bunch of songs this morning. And again, we welcome you this morning for those who have joined us. And uh, I mean, uh, I've been away a bit over August, and uh, so it's good to be here with you this morning. And so thank you for joining us today. And online, of course, we welcome you back uh, for those who have missed our services over the last five, six weeks. So we're glad to be here. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we go on. We have our giving online that you're welcome to use by way of e-transfer, and uh, that information is available at the, at the door, as well as there's tithing envelopes, and there are also a basket there. So that's uh, what we're doing right now as we continue on. Um, you can go ahead and stop at the table and take care of tithes and offerings when you depart, if you haven't already done that on your way in, or else use the e-transfer, which works very well. Um, this week, I'd like to invite the men to come. We're going to have a Thursday night, 7 o'clock, for, uh, for our men's meetings to start up, and we'll talk about what we'll do and, and just get together for coffee and, and fellowship. So men, men on Thursday night at 7 o'clock. Now, Kathleen, I think you had posted something about the ladies' group. Do you have anything you can tell us? So a week from this Wednesday? Okay. Okay, at your house? Book of Acts. Okay. Okay, so please, ladies, see Kathleen for a, a Wednesday morning ladies group that is going to be meeting, okay? And I know if uh, you're on our WGM family, you will get other posts there about things that are happening. And one of those is with our youth as we join together with uh, Lucas and Brenda Church, who are leading the youth group in a combined fashion between uh, Leslieville and ourselves here at Withrow. And so you're welcome to be a part of that if you have youth in the teen years. Um, again, I apologize that we don't have children's ministry this morning. Both Laurel and um, Denise were unable to be here. And so uh, we don't have that uh, in place for you. So I'm going to try and be as um, to the point as I possibly can this morning. <laughs> Uh, no guarantees, of course, but we'll try, okay? And so we're going to get into the word here. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I need to mention. Oh, on September 25th, the kids' ministry is kind of a kickoff for the fall, is going to be taking a group of whoever would like to join with the children's ministry. So if you have children in children's ministry and your families, they're going to the corn maze. That's a Saturday on the 25th of this month, and so just coming up shortly. And uh, if you haven't already, please get tickets from Denise, if you'd call her or get a hold of her. Laurel, or sorry, Brittany. <laughs> My other mother, Brittany. <laughs> mother, no, no, boy, we're going way, we're going, we're going way too far. Uh, scratch that, don't even let that go out online. Thank you very much. <laughs> Stop talking. Okay, so there are things out there for the kids to do, so you can just kind of slip out there and grab that at any point in time. I know that you always look forward to that, and uh, thank you, Brittany, my daughter, for coming in and uh, getting that set up after you talked to my wife, Laurel, on the phone and got that handled. And sorry, Mom, I didn't mean to do that. Okay, she's already with the Lord this morning if she can hear or see what I'm doing. I know that her prayers are eternal, and so she's still helping me out in that way. All right. Moving along, moving along. Let's go to Joshua, the fifth chapter, okay? Amen. I'm going to find another one of these guys. Well, it's good to be back. I don't know if you feel the same way about that, but... Uh, so, first, okay... So, uh, actually, before we go to Joshua 5, we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 1. And sorry, Shelley, I didn't give you those scriptures ahead of time, but Ephesians, the first chapter, and you're so quick on the, on the trigger back there, I'm sure you'll find it before I do. So, Ephesians, the first chapter, and uh, there we go, Ephesians 1. All right, we're talking about Joshua in these, uh, this series, so we're kind of picking up from where we left off back before the summer, okay? So, going back to the end of July... And, uh, oh, it's great to have the Lumen Claws with us, John and Sarah. And, uh, yeah, and they came and helped us out. Right on. You know, it's always funny. The guests get the claps. I never do, so that's, I'm not offended by that. But anyway, no. Um, I'm really going to get myself in trouble this morning if I do, quit doing what I'm doing. 
Um, you folks are going to be heading off back to your mission field in about two weeks, right? Going to BC in two weeks. Well, that's a good mission field over there too. So. Oh, really? Okay, so you are going to be in this part of the world for a while. All right. Well, it's good to have you here this morning. Okay. All right. Well, Lord, help me because I need it, and thank you. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, and it says in verse 10b, in other words, towards the end of, of verse 10, it says in Ephesians 1 verse 10, well, let's read the whole thing, with a view to administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on earth, in him also we have obtained, everybody say obtained, obtained an inheritance. We have obtained an inheritance. Obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his, of his will. So God has an inheritance that has, we have already obtained. It's been guaranteed and given to us. And so when we read through the book of Joshua, we realize that there was an inheritance that God had given to his children, the children of Israel, and that they were in the process of obtaining it. They were in the process of going through the promised land and getting the inheritance that God had promised them. Over in 1 Peter chapter 1, we'll go over there for a moment. Looking at verse 3 to verse 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved for, in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In verse 8 it says, and though you have not seen him, you love him, and though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy expressible and full of glory. Obtaining, verse 9, as the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As we go through the book of Joshua, we are looking at it from a perspective of the personal Christian life. That God has for us many wonderful promises. He has great victories and I believe that these, those are something we experience not just in the world to come, in the lifetime to come, the eternity to come, but also in the here and now. Are you okay with that? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is an inheritance in the heavenlies that we can pray would come and be a part of our experience now. The peace of God, the rule of God, the kingdom of God is his rule. It is his order. It is his will. So in this life, and obviously in the life to come, there are promises that God has given to us that we are in the process of obtaining. And so I believe God wants to give us victory over the things of this world and the things of our own soul and mind realm that are troubling us, that are affected by our fall, that he will come and help us take possession of. Is that okay? Yes. Amen? So some have written songs, and they're, they're good songs, and they sound good, and they're kind of nice, but they say crossing the Jordan is you dying, has anybody recognized any songs like that? Have you ever heard them? Oh, no. So you haven't. I'm the only one. I, I'm sorry, I can't quote them right now, but I know they're there. Okay, so the Jordan is like our death crossover into heaven. 
But I'm very hopeful that when I die and go to heaven, I don't have to defeat Jericho and then AI and then <laughs> all the giants. Are you with me? So I, I'm having a hard time thinking that that's the application. I'm thinking that the inheritance that God has for us, yes, it's eternal. Yes, it's for the future. Yes, it is for heaven. But I believe it's all for, also for now. The salvation of our souls is a process of saving all the different parts of who we are. That they might reflect the character of God in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, being conformed to his image and being transformed into his likeness is what we're about right now. And so Joshua was bringing the children of Israel to their inheritance. And by the way, Joshua is also the exact same meaning as the, as the name Jesus. Did you know that? Jesus and Joshua are the same word. One in the Hebrew and one into, is it Greek? I'm not sure. Is it Greek? Yeshua. It's the same thing. Which means the Lord, my Savior, my Deliverer. And so what does Jesus do? Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. And he came to deliver us and to save us from our sins, both now and forever. And so he came to change our hearts and our minds to become like his and to shed off the things that have affected us by the fall. Now I'll get to my first point. No. It is true. Let's read chapter... Five of Joshua, just going to read the first verse, because there's four things that I want us to get a hold of here in this book, this chapter five, because we're going to work our way through right from the, the top to the bottom of these verses. There are four things. The first one's already taken place, actually, in chapter four and chapter three. And that was that they crossed over. So before we read, I'm just going to say something about that. In this case, we look at the crossing of the Jordan into the promised land as our salvation. It can be applied in different ways, but I think it's safe to say we can do that with this, this at this time. Is that they were separated, transitioned, transferred across from the old life to the new life. From the old ways to the new ways. And they went through the River Jordan to do that. For us to go into the promises and the inheritance that God has for us will require, and I say this to any one of us here today or those, anyone that's, that's listening to my voice here today, that the first thing we need to do is to surrender. See, this, this message today is called Surrender Before Victory. The first thing that comes before we can have victory is our Surrender. So the first thing that needed to happen is they needed to surrender to what God had instructed them about going from the old life to the new life, from the old land to the new land. And that required that they would walk through this Jordan River that was swollen at flood stage. And the way they would do that is because the priests took the ark on their shoulders as instructed, and they walked out into the water, and the water stood up. And all of the children of Israel would have walked past that ark on their way over to the other side. What is that? That is a picture of God's provision of the cross. Jesus was the one who stepped into the water. He was our high priest. He was the one who took our sin, took our judgment upon himself, and he stood in that place for us. And we walked and we crossed into the new life through Christ. There is no other name under heaven by which man must be saved except for the name of Jesus. Amen? So the ark, the presence of God, the covenant of God was put into that place of judgment on our behalf and we are not facing our judgment anymore because Christ was judged for us. And we crossed over from death to life from old to new, because of him. 
And there was no one here that could have possibly, or no one back there that could have possibly saved themselves. You know, that water was at flood stage. If they would have tried, they would have been drowned, swept away. And I say it like this, there is, salvation is of the Lord. There's no one who can save themselves. You can't be good enough to save yourself. It is a gift of God. It is not the works that we can do. It is the grace of God that saves us. It's His kindness and mercy toward us and His provision. Put it this way, you may be a good swimmer. swimmer. You may even be a, a, an Olympian or a professional swimmer, but you're not going to be able to swim all the way to Hawaii. See, sin is falling short of the glory of God. Even the best of the best aren't good enough. The only way that you can get to Hawaii is either get into some kind of ship or now, of course, take a plane. And Jesus has paid the price provided the way. So that's the first thing. In order to get to our, our inheritance, to have victory in the things that God wants us to have victory in, is that we need to submit or surrender to Christ as our Savior. Now, a part of that also, I want us to realize that you have crossed into a war zone. <laughs> Have you ever been kind of had that notion given to you that, well, just get saved and everything's going to be fine? Life is going to be easy. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Isn't that what the kids say? Isn't that wrong? It sure is. Because you've entered into a war zone. We do not fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against spiritual darkness in heavenly places. It says in verse 1, let's read that in chapter 5 of Joshua. Now it came about when all the kings and the Amorites of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed that their hearts melted and there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. So the first thing I want us to understand about our salvation and our crossing over, it says that all heaven rejoices. And the power that God has given to you and I, we are such a threat against the kingdom of darkness. It says here that these kings were shaking in their boots. They, they had no spirit left. All their energy was gone. And I'll come back to this later, but you'd think, wow, what a time to go and attack. Of all the times, you know, Israel should have said, hey, let's just keep marching, guys. We can take them. They're afraid. There's, they're... But you know what fear does? I don't know about it, doesn't you? Fear can create anger. Because fear of loss, you're going to lose something. You, you start to get really troubled by that. And later on in the book of Joshua, we'll find that all these kings, probably who fought with each other a lot, started to come together and ally together to fight against Israel. And so this nervousness and fear that they had would turn into anger and resistance. In our soul realm, we know that the enemy does not like to give up his turf. The anger, <laughs> the bitterness, the resentment, habits. Are you with me? The enemy doesn't like to give up strongholds, all those things that, that you know, kind of keep us held back from the fullness of God, those things are the enemy's turf in, in some sense. Well, we're saved. Don't, don't feel like you're not saved. You're saved. You've got to cross the river. But there's more work to be done. There, there's more land to be taken. And that's what we're talking about this morning. And so all these enemies would eventually come together to fight against them. And obviously, if they would fight against them from... Against them from from day one. So what did Joshua do? Or what did God speak to Joshua that he should do? They're across the Jordan now, and you think, well, the next thing, of course, let's go take Jericho. But they weren't ready yet. There were some very important things that had to take place. And the first thing, let's read about it in verse 2 to 9. And he said to Joshua... 
At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make for yourself flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel the second time. How many times? It's like, it's like, really? Let's go to war. I'd rather go to war than be circumcised. Thank you very much. Huh? Is, is that all we need to do today is have that word, you know? And so it says, Joshua made himself flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath Haraloth, which means the hill of foreskins. That's what it means. I don't know if they made the hill or if it was a hill. <laughs> okay? We're talking a lot of guys, right? (laughs) You'll have to ask for the video. That's all I could say. (laughs) Anyway, that's what the name of the place was, the Hill of the Foreskins. I'm glad I'm from Withrow. (laughs) Withrow sounds really good to me. (laughs) Withrow, I guess, I don't know. So... So instead of going on to war, at a time when they think the enemies are vulnerable, he makes them vulnerable. He makes them in a place of awkwardness. He says, I need you to do something first before you go to war. We need to circumcise. Now it says circumcise again. It wasn't that they were doing a second circumcision on anyone. What it was, was they hadn't circumcised the young generation. The older ones who died in the wilderness had been circumcised, but they had failed to bring circumcision into their families. And that's why over and over again we'll see that they were a rebellious people. They were hard towards God and His Word. They had neglected so many things. One of them was circumcision, and circumcision was the mark of the covenant that God had given to Abraham that was to be given to all Israelites, the boys, obviously, and on the eighth day they were to be circumcised as a rite of their marking or their um, belonging to God. So important And he said, before you can go on to your victories, which I promise you will happen, we need to deal with some things from the past. We need to deal with this covenant that I had made with you. And he says, you need to be circumcised. Sometimes God doesn't make sense. Sometimes he asks us to do things that we're like, really? Verse 2, and we'll read down to verse 9. Okay, I'll go to verse 4. We already read verse 3. This is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt who were males, all the men of war, the ones who came out of Egypt, in other words, the older generation, died in the wilderness along the way after they'd come out of Egypt. For all the people who came out were circumcised... But all the people who were born in the wilderness along the way as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the sons of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, that is, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished because they did not listen to the voice of the Lord to whom the Lord had sworn that he would not let them see the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us a land flowing with milk and honey. The children, their children, whom he raised up in their place, Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them along the way. This really reminds me how important it is to lead our families in the ways of God as best we can. I know that there's... There's, you know, it's no guarantees, and the kids will make their choices. But mom and dad, let's do as best we can to teach them the ways of God and to lead them in the things of God. 
It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's older, he will not depart from it. Important. In fact, it's a lot easier on them to be able to make, you know, bigger things or do things that God wants them to do if, if we teach them when they're young. It got, that was probably pretty tough for the 30 and 35-year-olds and the 39-year-olds to catch up on what they had missed. I'm not trying to project any kind of guilt here. It's just a reminder to us to follow the Lord in His ways as parents for our children. Amen? Now, we realize, too, that circumcision today is understood in a different light. Circumcision is the circumcision of the heart. Paul taught very clearly that circumcision or uncircumcision is really nothing, but it has to do with the faith of the heart. And when we come to Christ, he is the one who circumcises the heart. And out of that comes various things. And one of those is baptism. Water baptism is, a, in my mind, my view, a picture of our circumcision. It is the identity with the covenant. That doesn't mean you're not saved if you haven't been water baptized, but it sure is a good idea. Amen? You okay with that? That was weak, but okay. Amen. There we go. So the second thing was God wanted to renew their covenant. And, uh, and it says in my footnotes that after three days they revived. <laughs> so they gave them those three days of healing. I think that's not very long. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know if I want to go to war <laughs> after three days of going through some kind of surgery. But it says that they revived. And I like that word revived. They came back to life. You know, and when we, you see in the New Testament, it talks about how we are to put aside the flesh. And that's really what circumcision was. It was a cutting away of the flesh. And as we come to God, through our salvation, we come to what's called sanctification, which means the ongoing process of cleansing and purifying our lives and the cutting away of our flesh. The flesh is anything we are, who we are outside of Christ. And so it says in a number of places, Colossians 3 and, and Ephesians, I believe is chapter 4, it says, put off the old and put on the new. Now that you have come to Christ, now that you have been saved, put off the old, cut it away, put it aside, and put on the new. And so God took them through this thing called circumcision as really a consecration of their lives. And he goes on from there. Oh, and by the way, uh, let's see. Mm, no, I'll carry on. Don't want to take up too much of our time here this morning. I think you get what I'm saying. Let's go on to chapter 5, verse 10 through 12. It says, while the sons of... Oh, you know why? I do want to say this one thing. It, it, they called the place Gilgal. I don't know if they changed it from foreskins to Gilgal, but I think it would have been a good idea. Right? So anyway, they, they, they call the place Gilgal because it means the reproach has rolled away. Isn't that great? You know, and, and sometimes there is a place to go before God, and it may take some time, and we've done these encounters before, and we've done these various things with Neil Anderson's materials, and, and you kind of take stock of your life. You, you go through your history and your past, and you start to identify things in, in your own experience, and maybe even reach back into your parents and your grandparents and former generations, and, and you bring those all to the Lord, and you begin to confess them to the Lord. You remember Daniel when he was preparing because it says that he realized that they were getting close to the end of the 70 years that they were assigned in Babylon. It says when he realized that he was getting close to that time, he began to seek the Lord. And you find in that prayer of Daniel is that he not only confessed his own sins, which was included, but he also confessed the sins of his forefathers. And so what I see here is a consecration of God's people. This, this cutting away is similar to confession and repentance in which they would deal with their history and saying, Lord, I am sorry on behalf of my forefathers. I'm sorry for our rebellion. I, I'm sorry for our unbelief. I'm sorry that we didn't follow you fully. I repent and ask that you would cleanse me from that. So before they could go on to victory, they needed to cleanse their lives. 
And it seems that at the outset of some great move of God, there is almost a, a higher amount of, of specific, per, I don't know how to even say this, God gets really serious about stuff sometimes. Like you said, this, this is a very special season. This is particularly important right now. You know, do you remember when, when that church first was birthed and they were all excited about so many people getting saved and they were bringing all their stuff to the apostles and they were laying it at their feet and, you know, just say, here, have our money, here, have some of our values of our land. Do you remember what happened? Remember that couple called Ananias and Sapphira? They come with some stuff, but they weren't truthful. And they were judged for that. And Ananias and Sapphira were dropped dead because they lied to the Holy Spirit. Well, I wonder how many times <laughs> we've lied about something. <laughs> but it seemed at the outset of that move of God, there was a particular seriousness about it. I just say that as kind of a side point, just something to note. God was very serious about setting out on this journey to make sure they dealt with these things in their lives. Thank you, Lord. Okay, the third thing. Reading verse 10 to 12 of chapter 5. While the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover the Passover, on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. And on the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during the year. Big thing changed. <laughs> it's like one step of obedience to what God wants will open up a door. You're quiet here this morning. I, I, I can't help but notice this. <laughs> Focus. When God asks us to do something, you don't know what's on the other side of that. And if we're willing to step out in faith and obedience to what he's asking of us, it may open up a whole new vista. Amen? When we start to go back to what we were supposed to do, you know, it says go back to those first things. You know, it says you've lost your first love. Go back. And recover that first love. That was what Hezekiah did when he they, were, they discovered the scrolls. They discovered the word of God. And so he made search of the word of God. And he, this is King Hezekiah many years later than this. But he went back in the records of what he found and he discovered that they had been neglecting the Passover. And Hezekiah went through a process of cleansing the temple of all the idols and all the false worship and the land of all the false worship. And he reinstated the worship of Passover and all the other things that were to go on in the house of God. And revival swept through the land. Passover was very important because it was the remembrance of, of uh, God bringing the people out of Egypt. And he had si assigned them to do this Passover. And they had neglected it as well. In fact, they had only done one Passover when they came in, or I think it was about that. Anyway, it was, Sinai was the last time. About one year into the 40 years of their wilderness wanderings was the only Passover that they kept. And yet on the, in the month of April, every year they were to keep the Passover. There too, just like circumcision, they had le left it aside. And I say this, we need to surrender to God in our salvation. We need to surrender to God in our consecration and, and dealing with the issues of our life that may go back in time or in present and saying, Lord, I surrender this. Cut this off out of my life. Cleanse my heart. Cleanse my mind. Help me to forgive my you know, family member. Help me to, to, to seek you and forgive these people around me. Help me, Lord, deal with this anger. Help me to deal with this unforgiveness and just set it all aside.
And thirdly, we need to submit ourselves to our worship life. The Passover was their worship life. They were to come before the Lord once a year. And this, not only was there three days of circumcision healing, now they were into another week of the Passover. And so they were to do all the things prescribed in the Passover. And they worshiped. We realize there's a very important scripture that Jesus spoke to his people when he said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. What is, he, what is this whole chapter about? It's surrender first before victory. It's that place of our relationship with God before trying to deal with all the difficulties and the strongholds that may be in our lives and even to know how to handle the things around our lives. So three days, so 13 days, basically two weeks. So backwards to any general or any commander that would go in and say, okay, these guys are vulnerable. And he said, no, first of all, we need to make ourselves vulnerable. Do you remember that part of scripture? And I don't have it in front of me to quote, but he's, God says, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And he says, the way I'm going to handle this may be very contrary to your thinking. It may be kind of backwards from what you think, but I want you to trust me. Submission is always the healthiest way to go with God. I realize in the past two years with COVID, the corporate worship has become a challenge. i and I say this to all of our folks online and those who cannot come out to service. I, we are with you. I am with you. We'll do everything we can. You know, obviously we haven't done enough, but, but to try and connect people together. We need one another. Amen? And the Passover was a time of coming together to worship the Lord. But we need one another. And, uh, you know, so I say that kindly, but we need one another. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 25. We'll just take a quick peek at that. Hebrews chapter 10. You've heard this before, but I'm going to read it. 19 to 25. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence, and, and please understand that the, the people in Hebrews were under a lot of persecution. They were even having to give up their properties. And the writer says, do you remember how it is you gave up your properties with joy? Ooh. We're not quite there yet, are we? Let's hope we don't ever get there. But they realized that they were a suffering church. They realized that the world didn't like them. That was pre-Christian culture. Before Rome came and made it the, made it the religion of, of the world at that time. So then there was the Christian culture in which Christianity has highly influenced our cultures. And now I dare say we are post-Christian, where Christianity now is looked down upon. Perhaps we're even going back to what it was like pre-Christian, where we're going to find ourselves as a persecuted church. I dare even talk about it here when we've got the Lubin Clubs with us, because they've probably seen things that we've never seen and know about things that we will never know about. But he goes on to say this, in that context, he says, therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw, let us, the word us is repeated in this passage of scripture many times, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession, hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. And so I asked myself, how much of that are we doing? 
Guilty as charged. Our focus is on, well, you know what our focus is on. I don't even have to talk about it. I'll leave you to guess about that. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. It's easy to get a new habit. And I dare say, and I say this with grace, please understand this. I could be a hermit. Anybody else here? Would you make a good hermit? I would, I would make a good hermit. Every once in a while, maybe once every six months, we'd check out with each other. But I could, honestly, as I get older, I could hermit better. And we could sit down and have a conversation about why that is, but I won't. But COVID has made a great opportunity to hermit. Like it totally legitimizes the whole thing. Now, again, please forgive me already while I speak. Just extend grace to me. I know I may offend some a little bit here. But I, and there are some, in some cases, that cannot come and best not come and really got to be careful about involving themselves in, in, the, in, in a group of people. And I honor that. I respect that in, in totally. But I want to say to those of us who can meet with people in, in your fellowship, whether it's a small group or a larger group, you need it. I need it. And I find that as I've drawn away for a period of time and say, oh, I think I'll just stay here, but I come back in and I say, oh, boy, did I need that. We need to worship the Lord. Yes, privately. Yes, you know, perhaps even in a very small group, but we need to worship the Lord corporately as well. And may God make that more available to us as we go along in these days. Thankfully, right now, it's not too bad. But maybe what that looks like in the days ahead, I don't know. There's a lot of things we don't know what's going to happen at this point in time. So if that makes you kind of upset with me for saying what I just said, please forgive me and you have to because the Bible tells you have to. <laughs> okay. Now, let's get to the last. Am I doing okay time-wise? I'm not stretching you out too bad here. Moms, dads, I know that kids kind of have this tank and it's about full right now, so hang in there with me for just a few more minutes. Verse 13 of chapter 5 of Joshua. The fifth chapter, looking at verse 13. Chapter 5, verse 13. And, and it's so cool that no longer did they have to eat just the manna, but they got... And that would be kind of frightening, but it would be kind of cool, wouldn't you think? It's like you get something else in your diet, you know? <laughs> and it was a gift. I mean, it, they, just, they just reached out and grabbed the produce of the land. They didn't even have to plant this stuff. God brought it to them, gave it to them as they entered the land. All right, verse 13. Now... It came about when Joshua was by Jericho. So here they are between the Jordan and, the Jericho, and, and, uh, and Jericho. And, and it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes. He lifted up his eyes. Chances are he was probably praying. Joshua was a praying man. It could have been that he was just in prayer as he was saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? We need to know how to do this. And he lifts, lifts up his eyes at one point, it says. And he looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us, or are you for our adversaries? And he said, no. Have you ever had that kind of a question asked you or you've asked somebody? You know, it may not be no, maybe yes. But it's like, do you want to go to Tim's or do you want to go to Starbucks? Sure. <laughs> it's like, 
Like, that gives you a lot of direction. You get that one answer that, I don't know if it answers both or doesn't answer either of them. You could say, do you want to go to Tim's or Starbucks? And they say, no, okay, that's a little easier to, you want to go somewhere else entirely. But he says, are you for us or are you for our adversaries? And he says, no. You can bring a lot of things into this. Bring your politics into this. Are you for us or are you for them? No. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you could bring a battle in a marriage. Are you for me or are you for her or are you for him? No. Church splits. I don't even want to ask to see hands if anybody's been through a church split because it's happened. It certainly happened. To us. And there's this sense of, I don't know what you want to call it, but sometimes a cockiness can get in there. Well, obviously the Lord's on our side. Because they see it the way I see it. And so you can say about some kind of division, whether it's in the family or the community or politics or the church, and say, Lord, are you for us, or man, whoever you are, are you for us or them? And the answer is no. Are you for the vaccination or are you not for vaccination? Boy, I'm stepping on things now. I just went from preaching to meddling. What if God says to you, no? He says, I want you to lift your eyes up a little higher. And so he said, no, I come to you as the Lord of the host of the armies of Israel. And Joshua hits the deck. You got to look up veggie tails on that one. <laughs> Anybody who ever seen it, you know? This guy, what are you saying? <laughs> it's like, Josh is, was it Tom or Larry? I don't know which one of the, you know, characters. Anyway, he is on his face in the sand and you can't hear a word he's saying, but he's muttering something. And essentially what he is saying is, what does the Lord have for his servant? What is it you are wanting to tell me? Because he recognized that he was before God. This was either a theophany or a Christophany. We don't know, you know, whether it was a pre kind of a experience with Christ himself or God came and, you know, in the form of an angel, whatever it was, but he knew that he was in the presence of the holy. And he fell on his face. Okay, God, what is it you want me to know? No, rather, indeed, I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord of hosts said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did. God just ramped it up. In a sense, what he's saying, this is not your battle. Yes, it's your battle. I'm going to bring you in. I'm going to fight for you and you with me. But I want you to know very clearly, this is my land. This land is holy because this is the promised land that I, I have promised all the way back all these generations, long before you ever got here. Submission before victory. Surrender before victory. Before Joshua could take, could go before, the, go into the land, go, go into Jericho and whatever it was, he had to be fully submitted to the lordship of God. The nations are the Lord's. Canada is God's. The people of our community are God's. The people of your family are the Lord's. Now, I'm not saying they're all saved, and I'm not saying that they're all, you know, going to go into eternity in heaven or whatever, in the new heaven and new earth. Well, I'm saying that he is Lord, and there is no other. 
And our focus has to be on him. I have leanings. I have concerns about what's going on with all that's going on right now. Don't believe me, I do. I do. But my number one, as I realize this, and this has been on mine, you know, we talked about it a couple weeks ago, Psalm 27. You know, we talked about all this, I will not fear, the Lord is my light, my salvation, of whom will I be afraid? The Lord is the defense or the stronghold of my life. I will not fear. And then he, and then he goes on and it's just like he turns around. He says, one thing I desire, and that is that I will seek, I will behold the beauty of the Lord in his tabernacle. And when you said to me, seek my face, I said, Lord, your face I will seek. Because he turned his focus to God. Now, do you see what happened here? You see, this kind of ends, all of a sudden just ends. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. But what took place, very following that, we're going to go into this next time, is he gave him some very specific instructions about Jericho. But it was the only time he told them to win that battle in that fashion. The next time they took it upon themselves just to go on into AI, that's going to be no problem. It's just a little town. We can handle that. They didn't seek the Lord. They did not inquire of the Lord. And they got beat. God in his grace took the mistake and turned it around to be used for their advantage as they went before the Lord. See, Joshua was not... This wasn't about Joshua. This wasn't about even the children of Israel. Ultimately, it was about God. Does that make sense? Whatever it is that you may be facing, I may be facing, whether it's in our family or in our community or in our personal life, there is no other place to go than to Him. To bow before Him and surrender everything we are and all that we have and and say, Lord, I am fully yours. Have your way. Things from my past need to be put under the blood of Christ. I'm here, Lord. What do you want to show me? Things in my recent past and people I haven't forgiven or people I've had, you know, I've been at odds with. And Maybe God would say, oh no, you're not supposed to go over to their place and walk around their house seven times and see if the walls fall in. You may say, you know what, I want you to give them a call. I want you to maybe go have coffee. Or maybe just write a note. And just say, you know what, I'm really sorry. In regards to the whole COVID thing, I've said this and I continue to say this. If people choose to not get vaccinated, for reasons of of which they believe very, very strongly and they've looked into things as best they can for what we know and they would rather not be vaccinated. And and for those who do choose to be vaccinated, those who feel that this is the best thing to do and it would be most protective for my situation in our circumstance, for reasons that I have, for the amount that I understand, I believe that's what's best for me. I want to say this very clearly. In either case, I am 100% behind you. Did I say something wrong? Because you are what's important. Amen? Paul said that we are to love one another with all our hearts. Love is way more important than a particular opinion on what is going on. And I'm not not saying this isn't important. This is affecting people's lives. Huge. Huge. And it's troublesome. Nothing breaks my heart more. Well, I shouldn't say that, but it breaks my heart a lot to see people and families not getting along, not seeing each other, not being willing to even talk. Or within community, or within church, or wherever it may be. This is like, you know how Satan, what's he want to do? He wants to divide and conquer. He wants to split everybody up. This has probably been one of the most challenging things to keep believers and followers of Christ together in love. And if you look through the scriptures, we've done that before, but 
strive to keep the unity of the faith and the bond of peace. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Are we okay? That doesn't mean I'm saying you, have, you shouldn't have an opinion one way or the other. No, have it. But my, my number one job as a, as a father, as a shepherd, as a person of the community is to do my best to keep people together. Amen? Because love covers a multitude of sins. All right. I think I better quit. Let's stand together. Anyway, the way of the Lord is, you know, do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. Submit yourselves to the Lord. Resist the devil, and he will flee. It's always about first submitting to God before the victories that will come. Amen? Let's sing Waymaker as we close. Father, we just thank you for your blessing today in our lives. Help us, Lord, to, to follow you with a whole heart. In Jesus' name, amen. I worship you, I worship you, cause you are way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are, cause you are way maker, miracle worker, your promise keeper, light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. And you are here, touching every heart. I worship you, I worship you. And you are here, Mending every heart, I worship you, and I worship you, and you are here, you're turning lives around, I worship you.
Father, we just want to thank you for uh, your word to us today. And Lord, in each of our lives, Lord, we have battles. Maybe there's some things that came out of this morning's message about surrender. That we are not our own. This is holy ground. We are the Lord's. You purchased us with a price. And Lord, our lives are dedicated, sanctified, and holy unto you. And it is your will to transform us into the likeness of Christ. To step by step and stage by stage to gain victory in our lives. And and then that just pours out into our situations, our circumstances. So we bow before you today. And Lord Jesus, on behalf of myself and everyone in this room and those who are online, we say, come Lord Jesus. We repent. We lay it all down again. We lay our lives at your feet and we ask that you would come and that you would just cleanse that you would restore, that you would renew, that you would reveal the things in our lives, Lord, that you, would, you just want to remove. You want walls torn down. You want those strongholds demolished. You want those, those whatever it is that's behind the stronghold, whether it's demonic influence or habits or tendencies that are non-glorifying to you, Lord, you want those removed that you might come and just have freedom in our lives. So we bow before you today. Help us to, in whatever way that you would show us, to, to worship, to have the Passover, to be reminded as we do even those, those days when we have Lord's Supper, that you came and you shed your blood and you broke, your body was broken on our behalf. 
and that every day we would remember that, and especially as we gather together. And ultimately, Lord, this is your battle, not ours. This is your land, not ours. These are your people, not ours. You have greater concern for those, our neighbors, our nation. Help us, Lord, to surrender it all to you, Lord Jesus, and to follow your directions. I ask your blessing on everyone in this room today and those online, that the Lord will bless you, the Lord will keep you, the Lord will make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you today. Have a wonderful day. And uh, if you want to talk, you want to pray about something, you want to just uh, share anything with me that's on your heart today, you're welcome to do that sometime as we make our way out of the room, make our way out of the building. Why don't you love on one another in whatever way?